You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. I just want to talk. I know what honest answers. Do you have any idea what's going on out there? I'm going to try and help you and your family. Hey, I want to thank you again for letting us stay here. through a few things when we go out during the day we like to stick to groups just for safety the red door it's the only way in and out of the house it stays closed and locked all the time <laughs> i have the keys it's the only set <laughs> most important thing what's he see it's okay just go inside we never go out at night The door was already open when you got there. Yeah. Then who opened it? I think they're sick. Put your mask on. Nobody's sick here. Can't trust anyone but family. You don't get it. How old are you, Travis? If you're lying to me, I will kill you. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to GeekFest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone, and today we are going to be covering a couple of topics, including the movie It Comes at Night. My son and I recently watched it, and we kind of left the movie theater scratching our heads trying to figure out what we had just seen exactly. I sit down in a few minutes, and you'll hear me try to put together this movie that is getting pretty good reviews for the most part, but it left me with more questions than answers, and I try to kind of examine exactly how I feel about it. One of the things that I have to warn you again is that, as usual, I'm going to have a lot of spoilers in this, so if you haven't seen the movie, you might want to skip this review until you watched it. But Plus, I also go into the subject of Certain movies that are really good that you really do not want to watch a second time. Trying to figure out if this is the type of movie that would fit this category. Then after that, I'm going to talk about the opening of Disney's World of Pandora. This is a whole new part of the Animal Kingdom theme park that includes what I would call the Avatar Land. And I have a review of its two main attraction rides. Some really, really wonderful, innovative stuff that I will let you guys know about. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about music in terms of how in the past I had an episode where I talked about some of the most influential albums that I've had and why they were so special to me. Well, I have another similar nostalgic type of situation where I got to go to a Hall & Oates concert and... It was a very unusual thing because of the fact that it was something that I've been looking to do for a very long time. And I will 
give you the history of why this particular band is so special to me when it comes to my growing up. So let's get started with It Comes at Night. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You are a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That spawn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the force will be with you, always. On today's movie segment, I'm going to talk about It Comes at Night, a movie that I recently saw with Kyle that is marketed as a horror film. And and you could kind of say it is a horror film, but it's more of a suspense thriller bordering on drama, I think. I believe the marketing is a little deceptive into what they're exactly they're giving you, but Let's talk about this story a little bit, and as usual, we will have spoilers, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, do not listen to this. But the movie starts off with what appears to be a couple of people in a house, all dressed up in hazmat suits type of clothing. They're wearing air-breathing masks, and they're wearing gloves, and they are appears to be in the process of removing a very ill older man from the house. He seems to have all these boils and he's breathing not right and he's not completely conscious or aware of what's happening around them. And the story progresses where they take him out into the woods and apparently basically put a pillow over his head and shoot him as if they're kind of putting him out of his misery. They throw him in a ditch, they burn him up. Okay, we then find out that we are dealing with a family. There's the father, played by Joel Edgerton, who is a pretty known actor. Seen him in too many things to even mention, from Warrior to Attack of the Clones. He has been a monster in terms of how many movies he's been working on over the last number of years. The rest of the actors are not very well known to me. There's the wife... And the son, they're both African-American. The son is probably a teenager, maybe uh, 18, 16, 17, 18, something like that. And, you know, we we don't know exactly what we're dealing with here. It, It appears that there's some kind of plague going on and that these people have come to the woods and live in a house in the woods, kind of away from everything to kind of try to survive this new world that they're living in. You don't get the impression that you're dealing with zombies or monsters or anything like that. But in the process of us learning what their lives are like, in terms of always being careful not to touch anything that resembles being infected, because of the fear of this infection, of this illness that will, you know, make you sick and take you right away. One night, somebody breaks into their house, and they catch the person, and the person tells them basically that, you know, he's not alone, his family are with him, and that they are not too far away, and he's just trying to get water, because they're they're running out of water, they could trade if they want, but this family is not very trusting of them, and one thing leads to another, and they, you know, he goes out with him to see, you know, to check out his story, on his way to where they're supposed to be going, they're kind of ambushed by what might be another person that might or might not have anything to do with this group. They're able to overcome this person and kill him. And in a way, this new guy kind of shows Joel Edgerton's character that, you know, you, you know, I'm, you can trust me. I'm here to help you. You know, I'm, I'll keep up my end of the bargain or whatever in terms of that. And they do finally catch up to the rest of the family. Now, when they bury, <laughs> if you will, this the person that they kill, there's another body in there which I don't understand what that means exactly. I don't know if that means that that person was killed earlier or maybe they had to kill a second person, you know, but not in front of us. You know, I don't know. This movie is full of so many unknown factors that it's really hard to understand. So they meet the family and this family comes to them to trade. They're going to trade food for water. And in the process, they tell them the story, you know, we're 
they're also, I guess, they, they escaped uh, whatever plague it is that was happening. They came to the woods and they lost a, a family member in the process, his, the guy's brother. And they're just looking for a place to kind of live and figure out what's going on. And they offer or they ask to see if, you know, can they just kind of live together? And after a lot of back and forth thinking about it, they agree that they're going to live together. They're going to, everybody's going to do their own chores. Everybody has to be careful. You know, there's a series of doors that lead to the front. Then you always have to keep those locked because that's how you make sure nobody comes in and infects them. So as time progresses, they very slowly start to trust each other, more or less. The son, the older son, if you will, you know, he's a teenager and he is having strange dreams about, you know, what happened to his grandfather in the beginning of the film. And a lot of times you can't really tell what is the dream and what is real. At night, there's no power, so they're basically using like lanterns or candles you know to see anything the sun seems to somewhat i would say become interested in the other guy's wife a little bit you know they don't explore it too deep but you can tell this is a kid that's you know he's hitting puberty and he's starting to wonder about things so there's that factor going on the little kid from the other family he just kind of minds his own business and does his own thing but we get to a point in the movie where, like I said, this teenager keeps having these weird dreams and we can't tell what's real and what's not. There might be other people nearby and at one point they the, their dog goes out to kind of chase somebody that the dog might have seen or might have smelled or something. And the dog disappears. When the dog returns way, 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 way later, the dog seems to be hurt like really really badly hurt to the point where they have to take the dog away and kind of put him out of his misery like they did with the grandfather earlier in the film at one point on one of these many nights where the kid is uh, the, the older kid is having trouble sleeping you know because of the nightmares he keeps having he hears the young kid crying sobbing somewhere and he finds him in a different room kind of crouching under another bed having a nightmare possibly. So he kind of, you know, brings him back to his own room where his parents are sleeping and puts him in there. And that kind of leads to this weird confrontation later in the day when little kid is heard coughing quite a bit, like he's becoming ill in some shape or form, uh, which leads to a confrontation between the two families. Joel Eckerton's family, they're off the bat, they're like, okay, this is not this isn't good. We have to kind of let's separate and go into two different rooms. And the following morning, the kid seems to be in worse shape than before. So this is where you get to the point in the movie where everything kind of hits the fan. They confront each other, not sure as to who did what. You know, the, on the previous night they were arguing over. Well, did you touch him? Did he? You know, did he touch something? What did he touch? Did you touch him? And they're like, yeah, I grabbed him by the hand. I brought him back to his room. So now everybody's afraid of each other because they don't know if somebody's infected and, and who's infected. Now, if this person touched that person and this person touched that person. So after everybody sleeps overnight, they wake up and the kid is in worse shape, like I said before. And that's when the guns come out <laughs> in terms of Edgerton's. He seems to be on this, well, you know, I know what I have to do if these people are infected. And the, the other family is kind of like, we just want to get out of here. And, you know, we're just going to take what's ours. And, you know, we'll take half the supplies. And the other family's like, no, you're not taking the supplies and blah, blah, blah. Guns are pulled. There's a struggle. And they try to overcome each other. And then Joel Edgerson's family gets the upper hand and is able to force them out of the house and they're leading them towards the woods which you kind of know which direction this is going in the process of heading towards the woods and once again he is in this death march type of mode because you know i guess he feels he has to do something about this infected family before they either come back and infect them they get into a fight they beat the crap out of each other and at the last moment the wife comes and shoots the other family's husband. Now, Edgerton is covered in blood, and now the wife and the little kid start to make a run for it while she's holding him, and, while, and then he takes a shot at her and kills the kid. 
and she is really hysterical and she even tells him to shoot her and he does so now you have a situation where between the wife and the, and the husband they pretty much killed the whole other family the kid is in complete shock they kind of go back in and this is where the film gets even a little more ambiguous because you see scenes of the kid looking in the mirror and he's spitting up something so it is very highly possible that this kid is getting sick now, the older kid. But then you also see images that might be dreams of the kid. You know, he might be dreaming of some stuff. And then the movie kind of ends with Edgerton and his wife by themselves in the kitchen, kind of staring at each other. He's covered in blood. She is in shock. You know, I, I honestly can't tell exactly what took place. That's the end of the movie. Now, like I said before, this movie was marketed like a horror film, as far as I'm concerned, because it, was, it had all to do with what is outside that door. Now, I understand that it's a very psychological exercise in the unknown and how people can turn on each other so easily. I get that. But I think there are way too many unanswered questions too many ambiguous situations and ambiguous endings. Well, there's only one ending, but it's very ambiguous. I mean, you can kind of say, all right, by the time this is over, the kid probably died because he's not sitting in the table very fast. Whatever images we were seeing might have been real of him coughing up stuff and, and being feeling sick and whatever. So it is possible that that happened even though you then have images of him walking towards the door and he doesn't seem to have anything wrong with him. The fact that they were all exposed to this other family and if the kid is sick, well, does that mean then that everybody else is sick? Because everybody touched each other and fought and, and struggled. So it is highly possible that even though those two guys, the husband and wife are the only ones left at the end, that they are also infected. That is very highly possible. So... Again, from the images we saw, if we are to believe them as reality and not nightmares, it is very possible that their son died from the illness very fast. Now, is this movie a good movie or a bad movie? Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty torn about it. Like I said before, I understand suspense and I understand ambiguity when it comes to not telling you everything, leaving some for the imagination. I kept waiting for some kind of explanation or some other kind i mean don't get me wrong i'm not demanding a happy ending in this movie and i've seen many movies that don't really have too happy of an endings and are pretty good movies i think this movie is very good at setting up the horrific situation that they're under and i've seen many movies that do that that set up a completely horrific scenario for the audience i think it is possible that as a director or as a writer, you might have done too much of that and not enough of the other thing. Is it simple to say you just have to fill in the blanks yourself? I guess it is. And does that make it a very artsy movie? Is it challenging, you know, a traditional film viewer's perception of how much information you need in order to appreciate and understand the film? I don't know, maybe. Or is it the fact that the movie is an absolute, complete downer if you kind of think you understand what has happened all the way to the end? That's a possibility too. And let me explain why that is. Are you a genre TV, film, sci-fi, horror, fantasy, toy, and convention nerd? Nerds! 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 Do you enjoy listening to podcasts? It rubs the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. <laughs> Do you ever wish you could co-host a podcast? Mom! Take it easy. Lower it. I'm, I'm not going to lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. This just might be your chance. Somebody help me! Help me! Help me! Help me! Shut up! Kickfest Rants is looking for new co-hosts. If you're interested, go to our homepage at geekfestrants.com and click on the hosting icon for more information. There are many films that I've seen that are very good films. And, you know, I tried to research a pretty big list. And many of them are foreign films because foreign films are a little more brave in terms of what direction they go and how hard they can push an audience. 
with situations like this, ambiguity, just depressing, not very happy endings type of stories. But let me give you a couple of examples of films that are absolutely, you know, good or excellent films, but they're not the type of films you want to watch again. Uh, many of them have to do with kind of end of the world type of scenarios. They were pretty good movies, and it's the type of movies that you as the audience are going along with the story. You're threading along with these people's struggles, and you get to a point where little by little, the struggles are too large, and they just kind of give in to the eventual demise <laughs> of your characters. You know, they're beaten. They're beaten characters. You are not getting out of this hole. The hole has consumed you. A lot of them have to do with apocalyptic themes. One movie I can think of, I remember, well, one was a TV movie called The Day After. A completely, completely downer of a nuclear war type of film. And it shows you the aftermath of a city, you know, completely devastated by nuclear war. There was another movie called Testament. Now, The Day After, I believe, was a TV movie. Testament was smaller in scope. It dealt more with a smaller family, let's say, in a smaller town, not a big city. But it was how little by little this family became basically consumed by radiation poisoning and how this woman's children are dying one by one. And it is just a, a devastating film that it just beats you up because it's so sad and depressing. In that vein, you also have a movie called On the Beach, which is about a, I believe it was a nuclear submarine trying to find safe harbor after a nuclear war. And they basically get to the point where they can't. They've gone to too many different locations and every location, sooner or later, the radiation is there or the radiation are, are very high. And you get to the point in the movie where I believe your last, uh, you know, your leads, they basically commit suicide because they don't want to continue in this manner. More recently, you had a movie called The Road, which is a very popular book. The movie had Viggo Mortensen as the lead. Again, a very good adaptation of the book in terms of the disaster locations and the cinematic struggles and, and this father and son team going through hell and high water trying to get you know, I think they were trying to get to the ocean. They were like somewhere in the middle of the States and they try to move all the way to the ocean because they somehow feel that if you reach the ocean, then, you know, you made it. And again, another movie where <laughs> your lead character bites the dust at the end. Uh, he's able to kind of deliver his son to the edge of the coast and another family kind of picks him up and takes care of him. So it is a little bit of a somewhat optimistic ending, but it's still, ugh. These are kind of films that you can appreciate what they've done, and most of the times you really don't want to watch them again. They are just too much of a downer. And that happens, you know, I understand that. You can watch a horror film, you can watch a sci-fi film, even thrillers, and you're still entertained and you're still somewhat fascinated by some of the characters. I watch Silence of the Lambs, I can watch that movie a million times. I know how it ends. It's scary, but it's a good movie. It's a very good movie. It's very entertaining. They're very charismatic characters. In these kind of situations, the characters are just, they're either very evil or complete victims. So it's a little hard to put yourself through that. Another movie that comes to mind is Requiem for a Dream. Now we're not dealing in post-apocalyptic environments. We're dealing with drug abuse. And again, you're going from a, somewhat healthy <laughs> set of characters to a completely devastated family and friends as a result of drug abuse. Very difficult film to watch. The first time is just a train wreck what these people do to themselves. Uh, I could not imagine watching it again. Another film I like to bring up is The Passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson's directed, uh, you know, amazing film. It's a credible depiction of what Christ's life might have been like. Super graphic, very controversial for its time for many different reasons, including the graphic nature of the violence in the film. Once again, you know, you could see it as a historic film in terms of look what happens to this man. But to put yourself through that, to put yourself through the 
torturous violence that he has to go through in order to reach the end of the film. It's something that, as much as I can appreciate the filmmaking aspect of it, I cannot put myself through that again. It is a, it is a different kind of experience. And the final one I would use as an example also is another film that is an amazing piece of filmmaking by a super famous director. I'm talking about Steven Spielberg's Schindler's List. Schindler's List is a great story. It is wonderfully shot, very artistic. It's in black and white. But to kind of have to see what, you know, his interpretations of the Nazis they were doing, what they were doing, and the manner in they were doing things, and the crazy psychological issues that came with all that, again, you really don't want to put yourself through that. It's not the type of movie that you could say, hey, it was on the other night, and I just kind of watched it. No, it's just... It's like, no, you don't, you know, emotionally, you don't want to put yourself to something like that. Maybe you can show it to someone else for the first time. Or if it's some kind of a learning type of thing, you know, you're in school, you're learning filmmaking, and hey, you got to watch this film because you're going to learn about blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it is not the type of thing that you just pop on, you know, for kicks. These are films that are very difficult. Now, these are the big ones I'm talking about. These are the big films, the ones that are probably most well-known I'm not going to put this film in that kind of category. But it kind of brings you to that whole issue of, you know, is this the type of film that you would watch a second time? And again, I'm very uh, torn by it because I don't see it necessarily as a horror film. I kind of see it as a spiraling, devastating, dramatic piece of fiction in the vein of these other films where... Everything falls apart. Nothing good comes out of it. And it's just an emotional, gut-wrenching exercise. Is there a place for something like this in cinema? Yes, it's there. Like I said before, there are many other, especially foreign films, that are a little braver and more willing to step into these scenarios. There's a lot of French films, I think Italian films and German films, that kind of explore these themes and I've seen a few of them, uh, and I understand that. The, the, the whole concept of not every film has a happy ending. That's more of a Western, you know, American type of thing. But, you know, I, I am still, I am somewhat curious as to see if there's anything I missed. Can I pick apart the dreams from the reality, you know, in some of the things we saw? Does understanding that help in figuring out exactly what's happening and what will happen, even though the director is not showing us what will happen exactly. Does it help? But then the problem is, if you do figure out what is happening and what will happen, does it make the film any better? I don't know. I'm afraid that by clarifying certain things, I'm just going to confirm the fact that this film is a complete and utter downer. So does that make things any better? I don't think so. <laughs> I was intrigued in terms of, I kept expecting some kind of twist at the end, something that would explain things or maybe put you in the right direction towards somewhat of a happier ending. But obviously that was not going to happen and it did not happen. I get it when somebody doesn't purposely give you all the answers. I understand that, that artistic decision. But is it possible that... You can get to a place where you just do not give enough information to let you have, you know, a fulfilled experience with a film. I guess that could happen too. This is definitely not the type of film that I would buy on Blu-ray, you know, when it comes out. But I am interested, I would be interested in trying to listen to the director explain himself a little more in terms of what he tried to do and whether or not he feels he achieved it. With that said... Maybe I do need to see it one more time to maybe appreciate it more. I know it got a lot of good reviews, but I, I'm not entirely sure if I am completely out in left field about this or if the reviews are not exactly as good as they might seem. So that is my somewhat <laughs> confusing, weird uh, review of this particular film. My son saw it with me, and he also kind of felt the same way. He wasn't very happy with it. And again, I don't know if it's because it's the 
unhappy ending part or the confusion. There was a lot of confusion, I know, at the end for us. And even after reading some articles and getting some clarification, it's like, okay, maybe that's what they meant. But it's still, you feel bad afterwards. You still feel, oh, that sucks. What happened to that family? You know, that, that kind of feeling. Like I mentioned before, being ambiguous is nothing new. Hell, if you guys remember The Sopranos and how that ended with that fate to black that pissed off so many people, but a lot of other people said, oh, that was the perfect ending because it just leaves you there to imagine what can possibly happen to, to, you know, to Tony. And it's like, yeah, I get that. But you know what? Especially with something like that where you invest so much time, you know, this is, you talk about years worth of uh, <laughs> uh, seasons, not getting a definitive answer to what happens next. This is one of those type of movies where you end up there going, oh crap, are they screwed? I think they're screwed. You know, that kind of thing. It's a very difficult kind of decision, you know, when you write that kind of movie and when you make that kind of movie. It's just a, a I guess it's a more of an artsy type of thing. It is not your mainstream <laughs> consumer summer type of flick. So, again, like I said before, I can appreciate certain things about it, but there are certain things that kind of left me flat. Let's see what happens when they put it on on DVD and Blu-ray. See if that gives me a, a little more of an explanation. And let's see if I change my mind about how I feel about it. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin direct via satellite from our on-the-spot task force. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Thank you, Bob. It's Mort. Mort, yes. I am Ted Baxter, and here is the news. In the news, you guys probably might have heard that in the Animal Kingdom at Disney, uh, here in Florida, they recently opened the Land of Pandora, famous Avatar-related part of the park that they've been building for a while now. Unusual selection when they first announced it. Avatar had been completely out of everybody's radar for a very long time. And to kind of coincide with the all of a sudden they were going to build a part of the park to have something to do with the movies, they also had announced that there were more movies coming. And as the progress in the construction of that park section went forward, the movie part, because it's supposed to be a multi-sequel endeavor, kept getting delayed and delayed. This is all happening while Star Wars is going crazy in the movies in terms of we're getting movies every year, and the announcement of the park expansion, you know, at Hollywood Studios and also in California with all these new Star Wars rights that are coming and Star Wars land and blah, blah, blah. And that all of a sudden not coming until 2019 seemed kind of unusual in terms of you have a franchise that's ready with product and the product is coming fast and furious, but you don't have the park to show off that thing. On the other hand, you have another franchise that the park is moving very fast with construction, but you have no product to show people in the movies. You know, it seemed like a very unusual, contradictory thing that was happening. Anyway, the time passed, you know, we're still about two years away from Star Wars land opening up. The movies are going strong. You were getting one every year, you know, so that's nothing new. But this summer, they finally opened up Pandora, the world of Avatar, basically, at Animal Kingdom. It's pretty uh, reasonable to understand why they picked the Animal Kingdom. The entire environment and rides having to do with Pandora is all about the animals and the nature of the film. All that world creation that was uh, brought into the film, uh, they managed to bring it into an area of the park with very, very spectacular results obviously the animal kingdom was the perfect location for it because since that park is already in that sort of theme of nature and animals and you know coexistence and that sort of thing it fit perfectly we kept trying to book fast passes you know so we don't have to wait in line ahead of time and i know there was a promotional period of time where they were letting people 
apply, I think, for fast passes before the actual opening. They were doing the soft test openings. And even to pre-book certain fast passes, you know, once the opening occurred, and we kept trying and we couldn't get it. One of the biggest problems is that regular tourists who um, stay at a hotel, you know, and get a get one of those Disney packages, they are allowed, I believe, a 60-day window in being able to book these fast pass tickets. However, regular season pass holders like ourselves are only allowed a 30-day window. So we're always having that problem that, you know, we're a lot of times you get beaten by other people to the punch because of the fact that they are tourists and they are staying at a resort. But this really applies mainly to like very new attractions, things that are very hot at the time. There was a point where the uh, Buzz Lightyear ride at, I think it was at Hollywood Studios, that was like the hot ride and it was impossible to get fast pass tickets but then little by little it started to ease it took time and then it was the frozen ride the frozen ride when that first opened again it's impossible to get on it and now it's a little more reasonable well reports were coming in (laughs) that an opening day of pandora people were waiting and it just happened that it was i think it might have been the same weekend or very close where Pandora was opening here in Florida and Guardians of the Galaxy ride, which was a a refurbished Tower of Terror ride in California had just opened. And people were lining up for hours. An acquaintance of mine even uh, sent me a text saying, can you believe these losers standing in line for all these hours? And my reply was, well, yeah, guess what? We were there for a couple of hours lining up too. We basically showed up at the park the first time at opening. When the park opened at 8 in the morning, we made it. Front gate, 8 in the morning. A ton of people. It was. It took a while just to get in. And once you got in, they diverted people into a different area so they don't all kind of rush into that same Pandora world. So they kind of rerouted everybody and made them all go into circles until you finally got to the back of the line, not of the rides, but of the section of the park. So we got on a line that took about 45 minutes just to reach... Pandora, the entrance to that part of the park. Once you're inside of the park, you really have two main attractions and a gift shop and a small kind of restaurant. The lines were insane that first day. We realized, okay, we're only going to get on one ride because we're only going to stand in line once. So we decided to go on the River Journey ride. I forget the full name of it, but it's it's a more of a calm ride. And we were online... Let me think. I would say about two plus hours. The line was snaking through most of (laughs) the Pandora area. While you're in line, we got to see all this amazing work that they've done with the natural trees and foliage there. They added, you know, additional things to those trees and, you know, alien looking plants attached to those trees and all these different growths in the water and these flowers that are very... I keep referring to them as Day of the Triffids. They're really weird looking. I mean, they're right out of the movie. It is just incredible what they've done. And we haven't been able to go there at night yet because from what I understand, they light that whole thing up. Even the ground you walk on has luminescent paint on certain areas. And when they turn on all those black lights at night, it apparently looks fantastic. But we were there in the morning. So we went through that, like I said, that two plus hour line Luckily, it wasn't too insanely hot. You know, we were able to stay in the shade most of the time. And we got to go on the river ride. Now, the river ride is, the easiest way to describe it is like, it's kind of like it's a small world. Let's put it that way. But instead of being in (laughs) all those crazy different countries that you can't get that song out of your head after a while, you're in the world of Pandora. And it's all an internal night world. The little boat goes through all these different sections. You have some animatronics. You have some talking Navi creatures. All types of foliage. All types of animals jumping. And they use so many different techniques nowadays. They're able to project images on areas that you're kind of like trying to figure out how exactly do they do that. It just blows your mind sometimes how they do these things. Because you're indoors, they are able to duplicate night and they're able to use all these black lights and all this luminescent flowers and things. I mean, it's right out of the movie. It's just ridiculous how good it is. Some of the 
animatronics now use a new system where they have an internal projection system in their head where they can project your eye movements and your mouth movements and even your cheek movements, not your nose, because the nose pretty much stays solid when you speak. But what's incredible is the fact that these animatronics are moving. The head is moving left and right. The mouth is opening and closing, but it's not a real mouth. It's an internally projected mouth. And that's the only way you can kind of figure out that that's how it works. Because if you were projecting eyes and mouth externally you know from the wall to the animatronic as the animatronic moves the projections would get out of whack they would miss the face but they have a way of doing it now where it's all internal so no matter where the head moves the projections are always in the face where they should be it is just incredible i can't really explain it you have to see it and when you see it you're like you just you're just kind of like trying to figure out what's happening it's you can tell your brain is like turning and making all these like calculations of saying how the hell did they do this they do it also these internal projections i think they're now doing them into other objects there was a scene where there appeared to be this bug crawling on a piece of wood and the, it's like a giant centipede and the centipede seems to be moving up and down the wood and like for, again the only way for that to function right is that it has to be projected internally because for something to be animated that way if you project it from the wall it gets lost after a while but no this thing continued so again it just blows your mind like i said the ride is a very calm ride you just go through all these different passages and then you come out of it you know there's certain areas where they're singing and you know like i said the animatronics and the full-blown size of the creatures the excellent wonderful we tried to go into the uh, gift shop the line was too long that day or the uh, little restaurant that couldn't do it so all right we did it the first day we at least got in and we saw one of the big attractions this past weekend we went for round two and round two consisted of trying to see the second attraction this time around, we also got in. First thing with the park open, no problems getting in. The lines were not insane like they were the previous time. And we could walk into the Pandora area again without getting in line this time. There was no line waiting to get into Pandora. There was, however, a line <laughs> to get into the second ride, the second major ride, which was the flight of the something. I forget what the rest of the name is, but it's, it's a flight simulator type of ride. And the way that it works... Uh, from the way that it was described is that you get to fly one of those uh, lizardy birds that the good guys get to fly and you get to experience flight on top of one of those creatures the line was labeled as 180 minutes which means if you do your math about three hours we got on it anyway i was like i i can't believe this we're getting in this but we got on it as you progress in the line, people started asking some of the people that work there, you know, is how long do you think the line is? And they were saying, ah, it's probably about two hours. Okay. So by the time we got to the front of the ride, it ended up being about an hour, 10 minutes. We were not there that long. So I have a feeling that they are purposely over exaggerating the the times just to kind of turn people away so people can say nah that's all right we'll do it next time just to kind of keep the lines a little lower they're artificially <laughs> inflating them to scare people away but as we got closer and closer you know the the time i remember kept changing the uh, on the front entrance so what was cool about it is that if that we were more or less we were continually moving on that line the ride itself is built into this gigantic structure where you have these huge, huge, huge floating rocks. You know, obviously they're not floating for real, but the structure of the building that houses the simulator is made to look like these huge rock structure. But approaching that rock structure, there are all these winding paths, you know, the people can line up in them, you know, keeps you moving and moving. And I could honestly say for the majority of the time we were online, we were technically moving slowly, but we were moving. We were never just kind of sitting there staring at each other without any movement for any long amount of time. Approaching the structure, you know, half the time we were in line, we were just approaching that structure, winding through the, through the maze that they make you go through, you know, waiting in line. Again, the, the amount of 
construction that they build it's incredible these flowers these waterfalls these all these different structures rocks and growths and all types of weird plants and like i said a combination of real plants with kind of like additional things on top of the plants it's just incredible to just watch it and like i said before i can't wait to see this at night so once you actually entered that whole structure you first off you're like inside caves very kind of prehistoric caves, and it's supposed to be the Navi with all kinds of paintings on the walls. Then you enter into a more scientific area, which I guess is where the humans are. And that's when you start to kind of hear the story. Hey, you're at the blah, 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 and this is the research lab, and this is what we do, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, you're in one area where you kind of see where all these flying birds are flying, and they're being tracked, you know, by radar, you know, futuristic radar. And then you get to an area where they're explaining to you the whole avatar process of, well, we have these avatars that you can kind of put your conscience into them, and then they go and interact with the real ones, and that's, that's the only way they accept you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever, doesn't matter. But they do have a life-size uh, Navi creature floating in the water, just like they did in the movie, where you're waiting for that creature to be implanted with your avatar. So that was pretty cool looking at that. Whole bunch of scientific looking stuff, really interesting. And then you you know, the closer you keep getting closer and closer to the area where you can now get on the ride and uh, we got to that area and you know, there's four entrances. So they sent you in four different directions, so that means they have four simulators more or less, you know, they're working. When we got to ours, you go through a series of passages where they tell you where to stand and you're number one, you're number two, you're number three, you know, you know, that kind of thing. And then you enter the simulator room. Now, the simulator room is basically a series of about, I don't remember, maybe 10 or 20, 10 and 20, or maybe eight and eight, something like that, motorcycle looking devices without wheels, let's say. So you kind of straddle a motorcycle looking device device and you kind of tilt forward and you have handles and when they start to activate the device to kind of get you in place all of a sudden a bar comes up from the back to kind of push your back forward a little bit bars come off from the sides to push your legs inward a little bit and i think there were some bars also from the front you know you have all kinds of feelers if you will or bars around your legs and your back to kind of simulate the pushing of, I guess, gravity from one side to the other, front and back. And you kind of tilt forward a little bit. You're kind of tilting forward like you would on a very fast motorcycle. The entire front opens up and you are in the middle of a huge, huge, somewhat circular, gigantic screen. Similar to what we have at Soren, you know, where you fly through all the different countries. Well, the way that this particular ride works is you are, like, advertised you are on one of these creatures and you're flying through all these different environments and other creatures come up and there's creatures jumping out of the water and it's really hard to describe this but i think it's a combination of soren in terms of how huge huge what you're seeing is in front of you the fact that if you're near water and water splashes at you, they actually throw water at you a little bit, little sprinkles of water to make it realistic. If you're riding by, I don't know, very floral trees or certain animals, you smell that. You smell animal smells, you smell flowers, you smell all different things. Again, similar to Soren, how they have that technology of giving you different sense experiences. With the way that the camera moves through all these environments and flying animals, the flight simulator part of this whole thing takes over and all of a sudden you feel yourself being pulled forward as if you're going downhill somewhere or it's slightly uphill or tilt left, tilt right. You get those G-force feelings of being pushed left and right and forward and back. It is just an unbelievable experience. The fact that they were able to combine so many different technological parts of all these different rides. For example, like I said, there's the soaring aspect, the gigantic view and the sights and the smells. The flight simulator aspect, you know, the star tours aspect of, oh my God, I can feel my body being pushed forward or back or sideways. And you know, you tilt your head, you're trying to dodge things because it's that realistic. And on top of everything, you're wearing 3D glasses. I forgot to mention that. It's a 3D ride. 
which Soaring is not, but Star Tours is. So it is by far the most incredible ride I've ever been on Disney. Don't get me wrong, I am still, you know, 100% in the Star Wars mode when I go to Disney. But as far as what is the best ride these days, I say it's this ride. This Pandora flight avatar thing is just amazing. It is just completely amazing. It is the hot ride. It is what everybody's going to want to see. It is what I want to go back and do again. Whenever we take anybody, that is the place we want to take them because that is just the bar has been set now and it's it's a pretty high bar, but it is just simply incredible. So this time around, because it wasn't that crowded, we were also able to go in the store. Uh, the store is nice, had a lot of a lot of products, the usual type of merch. Some of the hottest toys they weren't they didn't have them because uh, they were sold out. A lot of people are walking around with these. Uh, dinosaur-y looking bird things in the shoulder and you can control them from a little thing. Those were sold out right away. They were also selling these action figure dolls that they can scan your face and work your face into the Navi facial structures. It's a customized doll slash action figure. Retails for about 75 bucks. Way too expensive for my <laughs> for my pocketbook. But really cool looking. I took pictures. I, I there were people were lined up, you know, buying them left or I couldn't believe it. And we were able to also go into the uh, the little miniature restaurant they had there, the counter service restaurant. Very good food. We had just a little bit. We were just trying. It was also early in the morning, so they were only serving breakfast at the time. The other cool thing that they have is outside those stores, they have a life size. Again, I don't remember the name of it, but those those mechanical things that the the uh, the bad guys rode on the movie. You know, those robot controllable robotic looking uh, exoskeleton suits they have a life size one they're pretty cool too so overall I cannot gush over this more than I have it's very well worth the wait I normally will not get in a line waiting for something like this waiting for any ride for that long but this was worth it especially the second one the second one is just amazing you have to see it. If you have a chance and you're going to the park and you're going to be here, even if you have to get on that line, get it. Because this will be the new standard for, you'll be saying, well, was it better than Avatar? <laughs> Everything that you go on afterwards will be like, well, was it better or was it worse? Was it better or was it worse? This thing is just incredible. I can't wait to see who can top this because this is now, you know, the top of the line as far as theme park rides go as far as I and my family are concerned. Uh, what kind of music do you usually have here? Oh, we got both kinds. We got country and western. If you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? Do you mind if we dance with your dates? Why, no, not at all. Go right ahead. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These come to 11. We just washed the hair. No, I work on my hair a long time. He, he hit it. He hits my hair. what? I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. On today's music segment, I want to share a story that, again, goes back to my childhood, and it is kind of tied in a little bit to one of my previous segments that I gave you about very influential albums when I was young. Back in the 80s, early 80s, one of the many groups that I loved included Hall & Oates. I used to have, but I still do, they're in a bin in the garage, the H2O album. That's the album that had Man Eater and Private Eyes and, you know, the classic Hall & Oates hits. You know, they had other hits before that album, but I, I have a, a lot of them, obviously, on CD by this point. But back then, you know, they had that. 
1983, they came out with what I would consider to be their last big album, which was the Big Bam Boom album. This had music that, again, was was very much like them. But it was kind of the end of an era for them as far as their style. After that, they kind of changed a little bit. Some of them went in different directions and they tried exploring other aspects. So the Big Bam Boom album was one of the last ones that I purchased, I remember. And this was 1983 when the album came out. I was 13 years old. I was of an age where I started to understand there were such things as concerts and that artists would go on tour and you know perform their, their music, but I had not tried it yet at the time. So I remember back then... I had asked my mom, you know, and this is back when we lived in New York City. We were living in Queens. My parents both worked in Manhattan, so they were pretty close to the whole, you know, Madison Square Garden area, you know, the big tourist areas. And I asked my mom, you know, can you get me tickets to the concert? Because they were coming, apparently, in 1985. They were going to have a March concert at Madison Square Garden with their Big Bamboom tour. That was the name of the album. And my mom was equally clueless about how to get tickets. She at least worked in the area, so I figured she would know (laughs) how to get this done. And I don't remember exactly how it happened, but for a period of time, she was trying to get tickets. She used to work at a barbershop. She was a manicurist. And she had a customer who knew somebody who could get tickets and blah, blah, blah. And back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And this wasn't like going to Madison Square Garden or going to a ticket place nearby where you can just get on the line and buy tickets. She was trying to get them through a connection. Now, I don't know if the connection was supposed to be a scalper or just a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy. Because we've had experiences where a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy got us some really cool stuff at later years. But this particular case, the first time we tried doing something like that, it ended up in complete failure. The guy who knew a guy ended up not getting the tickets. She couldn't get them. It was either too late and also a combination of us not understanding that there was an actual place you can go and buy those stupid tickets. So Hall of Notes, who I wanted to be my first band that I wanted to go see, didn't happen. Later, I forget, a year or two later, I was able to go see Huey Lewis for the first time then because Huey Lewis had become my favorite band and it's still my favorite band. But for the last, oh boy, 30 plus years, something like that, 1985, I was 15 years old. I'm 47 now. Yeah, 30 plus years. That was one of my biggest regrets that I didn't get to see Hall & Oates Nowadays, who cares, you know, Hall & Oates practically, they practically don't exist anymore. You don't hear their music in the radio unless it's an oldie station or something like that. Well, lo and behold, we're in Florida now, and I hear that Hall & Oates is on tour. And, you know, when these older groups are on tour, they're not really promoting new albums anymore because they're really not recording new albums. They're kind of going around doing the best of, you know, greatest hits type of stuff. Well, Hall of Notes is on tour with Tears for Fears, another 80s <laughs> band. And this is something that happens nowadays, and as it's been happening for a while now, that, you know, some of these bands, they combine, they do a double bill. I guess it's cheaper for them to be able to tour the country if they share the stage. So I heard about it. I didn't pay too much attention to it. And then it got to be about a week before the concert they were coming to Orlando and I talked to my wife about it and I said you know I've been trying to see this band now for 30 years and I haven't been able to and you know Father's Day is coming up hey let's go see the band let's go see them we get two for the price of one and uh, you know she was also a fan not as big as me but you know she also liked the Tears for Fears they had so many hits and Hall of Notes so we went uh, to the Amway Center in Orlando a couple of nights ago, and we got to see Hall of Notes and Tears for Fears. The way that it worked was that Tears for Fears went first, because I wasn't even sure. I've never seen a dual band concert, and I was like, well, what do they do? do? Do they take turns singing songs, or does one go first and then the other one goes? You know, how does that work exactly? But the way that it worked was Tears for Fears went first, then they took a break in the middle. I guess that's the intermission, and then Hall of Notes came. With Tears for Fears, 
the two lead singers, they sounded pretty good. Certain songs sounded a little different, but it's amazing how many songs they have and how many songs they played. And there were certain songs I did not recognize at all. So I couldn't tell you if these were albums that they did later or maybe even current. I couldn't tell you that. But they played all of their huge hits. Everything from Shout to Everybody Wants to Rule the World to Mad World. Mad World. Oh my God, I love that song. And I love the covers that they've done later with movies like Donnie Darko and such. But they did play them all. The guys look, one guy looks exactly the same. The other guy looks basically older. But they're able to hit most of those notes as you remember them. And it's good because a lot of times the bands sound different when you hear them live. And these guys were pretty good. We had pretty much nosebleed seats. We were we could, we could were so far back that we were basically all the way up top against the wall. The wall was behind us. There was no people behind us. We were against the wall. <laughs> And they did have some huge monitors there for people to see. But still, we were so far back, those monitors were tiny. I brought binoculars with me because I said, screw it. I'm tired of going to concerts and everything being so tiny. So I was able to kind of get a little closer with the binoculars. So that kind of helped. Then, like I said, intermission comes, Hall of Notes. Those guys sounded great. There were some songs, again, that it wasn't that they sounded different live. Is that they... And this happens with a lot of artists I notice. Sometimes they play their songs almost at a different tempo, but on purpose. It's not like they're getting they're not getting it right. It's just that they it's an artistic thing that they do where the song seems to have a different beat to it almost. And it's awkward. But the majority of the songs, they're all there. They started off with a Big Bam Boom song called Family Man, which was a great, great interpretation of it. And the way that they that it introduced the band in terms of how they started, you know, kind of jamming into the beginning, leading into that song. That was awesome. That was probably one of the best songs they had out of all of them, you know, during the concert. They played Out of Touch, obviously, because, you know, that's the big bam boom hit. They did all their classics. You know, they went through the whole thing. They did have a few songs I didn't recognize because when these guys started to do their... Um, I guess their solo careers, they each kind of get a little bit something that they can throw into the tours. And at a certain point, Daryl Hall got off the guitar and went to the piano. So he did a little more, a little bit of his, of their slower songs, you know, their slower beat songs. And then they kind of came back with the fast stuff. And what was really cool was that, you know, with Tears for Fears, once they did their encore, they came back and did one final big song, which I think was Shout, I think. If I remember right, with Hall of Notes, once people were calling for the encore, they came back and they did something like three or four songs, you know, at the end, which is and they were and again, they're all hits. Every single one was hits, 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 hits. But it's interesting because those guys, they do look older, but they're still kind of the same. I mean, obviously they're not young kids anymore, but Daryl Hall, he you know, he's he's a tall guy, he's got the long hair. He's got a beard and a mustache, and he's wearing his darker glasses. So I guess he's trying to keep some kind of an image going on for his age. But he sounds great. And John Oates, he looks older. But still, they're still playing. You know, the rest of the band sounded great. And what the, the weirdest thing, and I don't know if it was an optical illusion or <laughs> or what, but every time I look through my binoculars, you got to remember... Hall is a pretty tall guy, and Oates is a pretty short guy. But every time I looked at the binoculars, it looked to me like Oates was getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> and I, again, I don't know. Maybe I was tired. My eyes, binoculars, maybe it was the smoke around the place. I don't know what it was. But I'm like, I gave Kim, the, I gave my, Kim my wife, the binoculars. I'm like, he looks like he's getting shorter. Am I, am I seeing things? But that was a weird, weird thing uh, that happened during the show. <laughs> well, like I said, they sounded great. And I got to fulfill a, uh, I guess you can call it a bucket list type of thing. You know, the concert that I never got to watch when I was young. I got to watch it very recently. It's funny because now I kind of put them back in the rotation. And another thing that was amazing that I had never seen before, but I had kind of heard it before was that during the intermission, when they're prepping, you know, Hall & Oates, they were playing on the video screens a couple of um, musical, I don't want to call them music videos, but kind of like behind the scenes or documentary type of things about some of the other work that they've done. And 
there was apparently this musical performance that Daryl Hall did. It's called Live from Daryl's House. And it's, I guess it's different performers coming over and working with him and doing some songs. And there was a performance by Sharon Jones, who is apparently a very well-known African-American singer. She's been around for a long time. And she did a song called 100 Days with him and the crew that he had there. And this is a song that had shown up recently on Luke Cage. Luke Cage, the Netflix Marvel show, part of it dealt with the bad guy that owns a club. And in the club, they were able to use real actual performers, singers. And this was one of the songs that they played during the show that I was like, oh my God, this is an awesome, awesome song. And they were playing it there, you know, as part of the intermission. And then when I got home later, I started like looking around YouTube and there it was. The 100 Days, uh, I guess you'd call it music video, you know, from the recording with Daryl Hall. So like I said before, overall, it was an awesome experience. I was able to... Because I was so far away, I really couldn't take any good pictures or anything like that. But through the magic of YouTube, so many people were recording <laughs> with their phones, both concerts. So I've been posting links to a lot of these. And I'll post one or two with today's show so you guys can get a feel of what these concerts were like. All right, well, that wraps it up for today's show. I hope you enjoyed our movie reviews and some of our other nostalgic trips through our early teenage years and our uh, visit to Disney, Pandora, and the uh, premiere of some of these new amazing rides. I'd like to remind you that we are part of the IC Robots Network. And if you like our show, if you have a chance, please visit the website for IC Robots and you will find all kinds of links to other shows that we recommend. And as usual, we'd like to thank you guys for listening and we will see you here next time at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. I was very skeptical that it was even physically possible to build the world of Pandora. This was a crazy thing to try to do. It's a real world experience. We are taking guests to Pandora. I don't know if I can even express how it feels to see something that I imagined in 1995 suddenly made physically real. We can send right. waves and pulses right. through the landscape. That thing is linked to every glowing plant in this land. They're using the absolute cutting edge technology, stuff that's never been applied before. Virtually everything in the world is a custom designed, complex, programmed piece of show equipment. Hundreds of plants, the entire ride systems, the Navi River journey is this beautiful, lyrical ride into the bioluminescent forest. There's something pretty amazing at the end of that river ride that you've never seen anything like in your life. Now, riding the Akron is a thrill. You're going to plunge, you're going to dive, you're going to see the world flying through it. Connect with a banshee. Fly over the landscape of Pandora. I know all the mechanics behind it, all the engineering. And I sit on it and ride it, and I can't believe it. This is going to be so much fun for people to interact directly. But there's just so much of it. It's a world. To stand there and walk underneath the floating mountains and look up and feel that mass over your head. People are truly immersed in this world. Nowhere else does that exist in any other theme park. This is a huge ensemble job. Digital design artists, structural engineers, robotics technicians. That's a stunning amount of innovation to make one believable world and all. I look forward to seeing you on Pandora. Well, not the camera. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2017. Oh, 
This broadcast is part of the IC Robots Radio Network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. <laughs>